There was a little boy that kneeled down to say his prayers before going to bed, and his mother and grandmother were there with him, and he says, uh, Dear God, I uh, thank you for my mommy and daddy and uh, for the rest of my family, and I pray that you would give me a good night's sleep. And there was a pause. And very loudly he says, And don't forget to get me a bicycle for my birthday. And the mommy looks over at the little boy and says, Honey, God isn't deaf. He says, Oh, I know, but Grandma is. <laughs> do, do you ever feel like God is deaf? That He doesn't hear the prayers that you, you bring to Him? That you have all of these needs and, and you are desperate at times and you bring those requests to God and yet it doesn't feel like He hears you. It feels like those prayers just fall on deaf ears. How can you pray during those seasons? We're looking at the prayers of Jesus that are recorded in Scripture, and we have ten examples of prayers that, that He prayed. And all of them come from these kinds of of moments. And I want you to turn your Bibles with me this morning to John chapter 11. So we're going to look at one of the prayers that Jesus prays in, in this kind of situation. And he, not only this time, but so many other times, Jesus teaches that he wants you and me to pray with confidence. Jesus does not believe that our prayers fall on deaf ears. And so he wants us to come before God with great boldness and confidence, knowing that our prayers are actually being heard. Just look at this prayer at the, towards the end of this chapter. Verse 41, as Jesus has gone to the the grave of Lazarus. He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. This is a, an interesting prayer of Jesus because he's not praying this, asking anything of God. This is a prayer where Jesus is actually using the prayer to teach those that are around. Now he is there at the grave of Lazarus. And he has received word that Lazarus was sick a number of days beforehand. The beginning of the chapter tells us how Jesus hears about Lazarus, who was a dear friend to Jesus. Verse 1, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. How do you respond whenever you receive word that somebody you care about is sick? I learned very early in my marriage that there is a right and a wrong way to respond whenever you find out that a loved one is sick. As it was early in our marriage and there was one of those times where Allie, my new bride, was sick and she had gone into the bathroom and I just stayed there in bed. And I learned, I was informed, that there is an expected response whenever you know that somebody is sick. And how much greater is that level of expectation when it's not just, I want them to be there to comfort me, but I know that this person can actually change the situation. 
Mary and Martha, they aren't calling to Jesus just because he is family, just because he is a friend. They are calling to Jesus because they believe in Jesus. They have been following Jesus. It, perhaps Mary and Martha are a part of the, the group of, of wealthy individuals that are supporting Jesus' ministry. They know that Jesus has gone out and he is coming into contact with people who have sicknesses, perhaps just like the one that Lazarus has, and he has come and he has removed that sickness. So they expect that when Jesus hears this, that not only does he care about them, but that he actually has the authority, the power to change the situation. Now look at what Jesus does. Verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. That's not what they expected. They, they knew what John has told us, that Jesus loves this family. And so they expected that whenever Jesus heard this, that he would immediately come. But instead, Jesus stays for two days. And we know that by the time Jesus arrives, Lazarus had been in the grave for four days. So it's very likely that Lazarus died almost uh, upon the servant leaving from Mary and Martha to go and tell Jesus. He wasn't that far away. He wasn't uh, a week's journey away. And so... You could say that, that Jesus didn't wait till he died, but it doesn't excuse Jesus' behavior. Because Jesus, John has already told us that Jesus has a knowledge of things that are going on that are beyond human ability to see. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, Jesus sees a man by the name of Nathaniel. And approaching, he says to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel asks, How do you know me? And Jesus answers, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip even called you. They were in a completely different area and Jesus says, I saw you and I know that you were under a fig tree. And I'm, Nathaniel, he is shocked. He is surprised by this. But John is telling this story to lay the foundation of who Jesus is. That he has this ability to know and to see things and he doesn't have to be physically present. So don't just let Jesus off the hook and say, if he was there, he would have done something, but he didn't know about it early enough. The reality is that Jesus is God, and some way that we can't comprehend, he had the knowledge that this was taking place long before the servant ever got there. And yet, he stayed where he was. And then the servant comes and Jesus still stays for two more days. From a human perspective, delay in response is interpreted as hostile intent or lack of concern, lack of control. If God forbid... This evening, you have an emergency in your home and you need to dial 911. You have an expectation of how long it should take for responders to arrive at your home. And if that response time is not fast enough, then you start to make judgments about that 
system. Either there is, there is no control and they, they don't, they're not able to manage the amount of crises that, that come up during a day. Or the person in charge, they aren't organized enough to, to have all the, the, the streets laid out and have responders located close enough where they can get there. Or you are starting to, to read into that they don't care about me. That in fact they want to harm me. And that's why they didn't respond. This is where you find Martha and Mary. They are in a pit. And Jesus could have done something and he chose not to. And so when Jesus finally arrives, Martha rushes out, doesn't wait for Jesus to come into the house. She rushes out and she is full of words. Look at the conversation that she has with him, starting in verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And don't interpret this as a belief that she still thinks Jesus can raise Lazarus from the dead. Because it's Martha that, that later, once they arrive at the tomb, she says, Jesus, you really don't want to open the grave because he's been there for four days. The smell is going to be really bad. And in Jewish thought, they believed that the spirit remained close to a body for up to two days. And on the third day, the body changed color, the smell started to, to um, come as the body decayed, and the spirit was locked out of the body. And then the spirit would then go into um, Sheol, go into the grave. And so whenever she says, says he's been there for four days, she isn't having any kind of hope that Jesus is going to be able to change any of this. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the last day, the resurrection. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? The trouble is that she doesn't. She has all the right words. She, she, believes, she says that, that, that I believe that you are the Messiah. I believe you are the Son of God who has come into this world. She says, I believe in you in spite of the fact that this has happened, in spite of the fact that, that my brother has died. I believe this. But she really doesn't. Mary, whenever she comes to Jesus, she comes not full of words, but full of tears. She's only able to get out one sentence. Verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her weeping, he was deeply troubled. He was angered in his spirit and he was disturbed. He was troubled. They, these two women come to Jesus stuck in the pit stating their if only. When is the last time that you stated your if only? If only he hadn't stepped out in front of the car. If only she had worked a bit harder and not failed the exam. If only a different president had been elected the last time around. If only we hadn't decided to go on holiday that very week. Whatever it is, there is this sickening sense that if, if only... 
we could change things. That's what movies are made of. Movies like Back to the Future where somebody has some knowledge and they're able to go back in time and they're able to make some change that, that then is impacting the future. If only. And that is a frequent question of those who find themselves in the pit. But Jesus doesn't address their if only. He wants them to reframe the question not as if only, but if Jesus. Do you remember the prayer that Jesus prays as he's at the grave? He says, I knew that you are always with me, verse 42, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus prays at this moment, this kind of prayer, because he wants to assure the people that he is who he says he is. There are two assurances that Jesus provides for his followers in this moment. The first assurance is that he is the resurrection and the life. That he is the resurrection. And He is the life. Mary's trouble is not that she doesn't believe in the resurrection. Her trouble is that she does not believe that the resurrection is standing right in front of her. It's not that she doesn't believe in life one day. It's that she is struggling to see how that resurrection and life is right in front of her and how it changes her current situation. You've heard me tell this illustration before, but I think it is worth repeating. Kurt Vonnegut, after the bombing of Hiroshima, he wrote a book, a fiction, called um, Cat's Cradle. In that book, the, the main character is writing a book. And in his research, he comes across a book that, that is titled, What Can a Thoughtful Man Hope for Mankind on Earth, Given the Experience of the Past Million Years? And whenever he turns to that chapter, he finds that it's only one word long. Nothing. And that is true. That if you look at the course of history and how things have gone, man has absolutely nothing to hope for unless something different enters into this world. The best predictor of, of future action is past action. And so if you just look at the history of everything, then that says nothing is going to change. There is no hope whatsoever unless there is a new item that is, that is entered into the system. And Jesus is that system. He is entered into the picture. And the question can no longer be if only, but if Jesus if Jesus is who he says he is, if Jesus is who Martha is coming to believe that he is, if Jesus is the Messiah, the one who is promised by the prophets, the one who was to come into the world, if Jesus is God's own son, the one whom the living God is strangely and newly present in this world, if he is the resurrection in person, life come to life then the future has come bursting into pre to the present. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 10, that if Christ is in you, 
If Jesus is who he says he is and he is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life. Even though death still exists, even though your body is still decaying, if Jesus is the resurrection and the life, all bets are off. Everything has changed. And this is not just a hope in the future that somehow the present we have the resurrection and the life with us. So if you are like Martha, if you are like Mary, and you have your if onlys, run to Jesus with your questions, but be prepared for a response that you don't expect. Because the second assurance that Jesus provides for these people and how we can pray with confidence is that Jesus is busy about the work of intercession and intervention. What is it that Jesus was doing for two days? For two days after the servant comes, he stays where he is. Whenever Jesus arrives at the tomb in verse 41, he begins the prayer by saying, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Now why would Jesus begin a prayer by saying, I thank you that you have heard me? That's, that's a past tense language. What John is providing a clue for you is that during the delay, Jesus wasn't inactive. That in this two days that he is staying where he is, Jesus is interceding on behalf of Lazarus. And perhaps whenever they get to the tomb and they roll the stone away, there is no smell because that is confirmation. Jesus' prayer has been answered. That during this four-day period of time, beyond any kind of biological reason, this body is not decaying because Jesus himself has been interceding and intervening for Lazarus, for Martha, and for Mary. From our human perspective, the delay seems cruel and unusual punishment handed down by a cruel and unjust God. But from the divine perspective, if we could see what can't be seen with human eyes, then you would see that God is active when it seems that he's not. Do you remember when Jesus was in the conflict with some of the religious leaders of the day about him performing healings on the Sabbath day? And he quotes to them from John, or he says to this, them in John 5, verse 17, he says in his defense, my father is always at work even to this very day. See, they had assumed that God rested at certain times. And so whenever you don't hear from God, whenever you don't see God working, then God has just stepped back and He's not doing anything. But Jesus demonstrates in this prayer that God is actively involved in this delay. That Jesus... <laughs> In his prayer, he wants you to see through your tears that God is still near and you are still within his sphere of influence. 
that you have someone who is interceding for you. Even whenever you don't have the words, even whenever you don't fully believe, as Martha and Mary, they don't fully believe, they don't fully comprehend who Jesus is. You have someone who is interceding and intervening on your behalf. Again, from Romans chapter 8, Paul says that we, in the same way, have the Spirit who helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. That you don't have to even believe the words that you're praying, but the very fact that you are coming to God in your pain that you have someone who does believe. Someone who does know. Someone who does understand beyond what you can comprehend. And He is interceding for you. And He is intervening for you. He is waging in a battle for your life, for what's going on in your life in ways that you can't comprehend, in ways that you cannot see. And it is one of the joys of our churches that we get to participate in this with, with Jesus. Hans was a seminary professor that was in deep grieving and mourning over the loss of his wife. So for a period of days, he just locked himself up in his apartment, stopped eating, stopped receiving phone calls from friends and co-workers. The president of the seminary that he worked at came to visit with three other professors. And they came to knock on the door, and, and they were met with this disheveled man and they asked if they could pray with him. And it, Hans said, I, I don't know that I can pray. I don't, in fact, I, I don't know that I even believe in God anymore. And the president looked at him compassionately and said, That's okay. We'll believe for you. And we'll pray for you. So daily, these three friends, presidents and this man who is grieving, they meet to pray. After a period of months, Hans finally interrupts them before they start to pray, and he says, I don't want you to pray for him anymore. I want you to pray with me. And that is one of the joys of what we get to do is that you may find yourself in one of those pits where you can't find yourself enough faith to believe in the resurrection and life. And that it has anything to do with the place that you find yourself in. And you don't have to. We can pray for you. We can believe for you. You have the Holy Spirit that will intercede for you and intervene for you. We're going to sing a song of invitation and if we can do that, if we can intervene, intercede for you, I'm going to be up here. There's going to be one of our elders up at the front and if, if you don't want to come to the front, we're going to have another elder that, that will be in the back that would, we would love to be able to join with you and for you in prayer. Maybe you're here and you need to come to know Jesus as the resurrection and the life. We would love to help you in that as well. Please respond to the gospel message as we stand together and sing. Lord.
Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Send us love, send us power, send us grace.